and good evening. Um, thanks to those who are um, with us this evening. We, as I said, have a little bit of a problem uh, in that um, two speakers in Africa are clearly not able to, to reach us, but we do have somebody very special here, so that's okay. Um, and um, I think most of you know that um, I'm Marion Pallister, I'm Chair of Pax Christie Scotland, and I think you also know that I'm a great believer in the fact that uh, there are huge links between the climate emergency and peace. Sadly, uh, there was news today that the world could in fact breach the new average temperature record this year or next, which is quite scary. Um, but on Saturday, it's Mother Earth Day. And so uh, we're trying to be positive about all of this. Um, hard when the UK government has recently criticized for axing its most senior climate, um, climate diplomat post. Uh, there is hope. Uh, there's a publication, Our Mother Earth, a Christian reading of the challenge of the environment by Pope Francis. Uh, and in that, uh, ecumenical patriarch Bartholomew writes in the preface, the urgent challenge to protect our common home includes a concern to bring the whole human family together to seek a sustainable and integral development for we know that things can change. The creator did not abandon us. He never forsakes his loving plan or repents of having created us. Humanity still has the ability to work together in building our common home. So we're coming together today from different parts of the world, we hope at some point, um, to consider how we're going to bring about that change. And I think that we should pray about that initially. So I'm going to hand over to our chaplain, Father Jim Clark, who's going to offer a short reflection and prayer to open our event. Thank you, Father Jim. Thank you, Marion. Um, well, up here in Scotland, it's a lovely evening. Um, and that gives us uh, all the visual aids that we need to to reflect on the beauty of Mother Earth. And I'm told tonight in Scotland, you'll be able to see the Northern Lights very clear uh, because it's a clear, clear sky. So perhaps tonight is a good night for us to reflect on the beauty of the Earth as our mother. I thought that we were looking through Laudato Si and I thought we could begin our, our meeting with a prayer for the Earth as proposed by Pope Francis. All powerful God, you are present in the whole universe and in the smallest of your creatures. You embrace with your tenderness all that exists. Pour out upon us the power of your love that we may protect life and beauty. Fill us with peace that we may live as brothers and sisters, harming no one. O God of the poor, Help us to rescue the abandoned and forgotten of this earth, so precious in your eyes. Bring healing to our lives, that we may protect the world and not prey on it, that we may sow beauty, not pollution and destruction. Touch the hearts of those who look only for gain at the expense of the poor and the earth. Teach us to discover the worth of each thing, to be filled with awe and contemplation, to recognize that we are profoundly united with every creature as we journey towards your infinite light. We thank you for being with us each day. Encourage us, we pray, in our struggle for justice, love and peace.
Thank you very, very much for that. And um, I'm going to um, I'm I'm going to uh, change my gender at the moment because <laughs> um, I've right. Mike Muenda is joining as we speak, but if he doesn't, he has sent me his um, he sent me his presentation. So thank you very much to Father Jim. And um, now let's see if we are in fact. Mike, I see you. Can can you talk to us and see if we can hear you? Hi, Marian. Okay, go for it. And and if you if you drop out again, I've got your I've got your presentation. Just give me a second till I tell people who you are, um, because uh, that is is pretty important. Um, Father Jim has set us on track for the discussion. Uh, Mike um, is a Zambian journalist, and he's going to talk to us about the plight of victims of climate change and the situations that he's reported on. Um, Mike's got a passion for environment and humanity. He lives in Lusaka, Zambia's capital city, and for the past nine years, he's written about climate change, environmental degradation, and the effect on people at grassroots level. He feels he has an obligation to understand what's happening to our Mother Earth and why. He writes for the Life Gate. Um, an online Italian venture with a mission to create the largest international network of information and services for people, businesses, NGOs and institutions working towards a sustainable future. Mike writes about environmental and human rights issues affecting the East and Southern African countries. He's, he's no stranger to Scotland uh, and he's also visited Italy, Kenya, Tanzania, Zimbabwe, and South Africa. And he's an advocate for women's rights and empowerment in the southern part of Africa. And he's most welcome to our forum this evening. And as I say, Mike, if it doesn't work, you've sent me that. Uh, and so it, it, it won't be lost. Don't worry, off you go. Oh, I think we've lost him already. Let's hear you, Mike. Hey, Marion, should I start? Yes, please. Yes, go. Okay. Okay. My apologies. I'm in the rural areas of Lusaka. Um, Lusaka. Uh, my network is a bit bad, but um, let me try to see what I can do. Okay. Um, so, so the effects of climate change on the African continent is real, okay? And uh, it's actually happening right now. Because of climate change, Africa is heating up and drying out. And uh, as Marian has just, has just from explaining, I'm, um, I'm, a, I'm a journalist and I'm, I have a very strong passion for the environment. So according to some of the environmental experts that I've spoken to, they have told me that uh, the heat temperatures, especially on the continent of Africa, is said to increase possibly towards the range of three degrees to six degrees by the end of the 21st century. And that is if Africa uh, reliances on dead fossil fuels continues. Okay, and um, here are some of the ways on how climate change has impacted Africa. So in the recent years, I've personally witnessed and documented the stories pertaining to devastating droughts. Okay, we have a situation in um, in Somalia where, for the past four years, it has never rained. So now, can you imagine this food security of those people there? A lot of children are dying from malnutrition. There's um, 
problem to do with the social, there's some social economical issues that are that has been um, that has been triggered as a result of uh, this uh, effect of droughts. Okay, unpredictable rainfall patterns. Okay, in most part of Africa, we are having an unreliable. We can't predict when we can have a normal rainfall pattern. As a result, we um, hunger, poverty has actually increased in most part of Africa. Um, there's also climate also uh, climate change has also um, caused massive extinction of uh, indigenous plants and other animal species. Okay, and the extinction is mainly attributed to global warming and also indiscriminate uh, human activities. Uh, as human beings, I think over the years, I've noted that uh, we have been very careless, especially in Africa. Maybe we like uh, this uh, a lack of awareness, but um, the respect towards the environment, I think it hasn't been that, uh, that good. As a result, we are seeing a lot of indigenous plants and animal species that are going extinct. Okay, and uh, local populations that are also unable to cope with the drastic changes in weather patterns and tropical storms. We have a situation in Africa where a country like Mozambique and Malawi, they have been battered by various tropical storms. Okay, and like uh, the case of uh, Mozambique, in the space of four years, about four different uh, cyclones have hit that particular country. Okay. And uh, that has pushed people in uh, abject poverty. It has also reversed the social and economical gains that uh, the country has made so far. So that has also triggered a lot of food insecurity. Okay, and you find that most of these countries where these storms are coming, uh, are, are making landfall, they are basically, these are very poor countries. And for whatever gains that they've made, find that they are being reversed within a brink of a second. And uh, despite Africa, you know, Africa only contributes towards maybe about 3% towards uh, global warming. Uh, but uh, the impacts, the effects of climate change that are affecting Africa, Africa now is the victim of climate change. So my dear friends, I'm here, by I'm here to tell you that uh, here in Africa, we are already living in one of the hottest periods in our history. And I strongly believe that the effects of climate change on, uh, on the African continent in the next uh, coming years to come, it will be disastrous. That's what I think. So I feel like there's a need for uh, massive awareness. Uh, we need to trigger the conversation. We need to keep the conversation going. We need to re-strategize. If the messages that we've been advocating so far has not um, uh, has not uh, like the message if the messages that we are sending out now if it's not loud and clear we need to re-strategize rethink on how we can redesign our intervention or our advocacy so that countries like Africa must be put into consideration. So the effects of climate change on Africa has also resulted in constant high temperatures during the day and night in parts of the continent, prolonged periods. Now, what does that mean? It means that people are unable to regulate their body temperature and often succumb to heat related health issues or even death. Okay, there are times where if you come to Africa, like uh, one of the hottest period, like in October, our temperatures go up to 43 degrees. 47 degrees in countries like Somalia, Ethiopia. And a lot of people are dying as a result of um, this, uh, uh, these uh, abnormal temperatures. And all these are as a result of climate change. So in my conclusion, I strongly feel that fossil fuel industry is driving the effects of climate change, especially in Africa. So through their air pollution of air and water and soil, Okay, you find a lot of water bodies in Africa that have been polluted by the fossil fuel industry. Um, the soil, you find that local inhabitants are unable to plant their um, crops as a result of uh, these pollutions. Okay, so in order to mitigate the effects of climate change in Africa and elsewhere, I strongly believe that we must rise up and speak with one voice. We must campaign and talk boldly we know what we need to do.
you and I know what we need to do. We have to limit global warming at pre-industrial levels, okay? And yet the fossil fuel industry is currently locking up fossil uh, exploration and development like the situation in Uganda, Tanzania, and Angola, and Nigeria, and among others. Lastly, you and I, you and I know that there's a problem that we know and how to solve by urgent shifting away from coal-fired power stations towards renewable energy in just a transition. Yeah, I think it's something, it's a situation that we can tackle, but we need concerted efforts and no one should be left behind. So I feel this is a good time to trigger the conversation. Uh, we need to keep the conversation going. There's a situation, there's a crisis, and we just can't sit and just see the situation just spike and go uncontrollable. This is the only planet that we have. We do not have any option. So I, Marian, I think that's what I, I tried to put together. Um, yeah, and I'm also keen to hear from uh, my colleagues what they have to share. If there's any question, I'm glad to, to take. Thank you, Mike. And I think that we will, uh, I'm asking people to put their questions and their comments into the chat. Um, but could I ask you just now, we'll, we'll address those questions uh, at the end when we've, we've also uh, heard from a, a, another speaker, but um, you have written um, about some real tragic situations. Um, could you give us a flavor of some of the stories that have affected people um, you know, you've given us a, a wonderful overview of what is happening and some terrible figures, but could you give us what's happening to individual people? Okay. Okay, y yes, Marianne. Okay. Um... Maybe let me just try to personalize the, the conversation. Um, I was in Mozambique. Okay, I was in Mozambique uh, when the cyclone, Cyclone Fred, after it just uh, devastated the, that country and then it left. And then LifeGate assigned me to go and um, document the stories of. Um, uh, the, the life experiences on how this uh, situation, this climate change effect has affected those people. Um, I was really moved that within a blink of a second, the, the livelihood of thousands of people, whatever people, what oh, if all the, the, the efforts that ever they have made, um, just been washed away within the blink of a second. So, and there's this one woman who lost her entire family and um, that she was contemplating of committing suicide. And uh, a lot of people have been um, left and um, I don't know how I can explain it, but a lot of people that have been put in a situation that uh, it's difficult for them. Oh dear, we've just lost Mike at. To come out. Really... And um, unfortunately, You're back, Mike. Okay. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Okay, can you finish that story about Mozambique? Because I think people would be very interested to hear um, that tragedy. I know that I've experienced that in India 
But in India, those cyclones were not happening when I was reporting. They weren't happening with the frequency that Mozambique has experienced uh, very recently. So tell us, tell us the end of that story about the people in Mozambique. Okay, so um, there's one village. It had um, a population of about uh, 2,300 people. In that particular region, 630 people died. I think that was in 2019. And, um, and their, their, their major source of, their major source of living was, was uh, these people were basically depending on this lake. Unfortunately, the, um, the fish that were, that this, because these people were, their major source of living was fishing. So when the cyclone came, it washed away all their crops. It, the, the lake, it, the, the fish in the lake, it all disappeared and uh, the pollution from a nearby a gold mine went into the communities of these people and uh, the water bodies, their water bodies were contaminated. So these people basically, they have no option. So they have resorted to taking the contaminated water. So climate change put us in a situation where um, if we do not adequately prepare, is a situation that we, we, are, we are capable of facing, but I think we have an opportunity. We have an opportunity. It's not, we have, a lot, we have the damage has been done, but there's something that we can do. So like countries, like the example I've given you about the issue of Mozambique, where the, in, the aquifer, the water bodies on the ground have been contaminated as a result of this situation. And people, as a, result, as a result, they are drinking this contaminated water. Basically, they are polluting their lives. So it's a situation, it's an unforeseen situation, but it's a situation which has been triggered by climate change. And I think there is something that we can do about it. We just can't just sit. If we can be comfortable, if we are not affected, just know that if you're not affected, just know that your neighbor somewhere is being affected. And we have a responsibility towards the environment. There's something that we can do together, yeah. Do you think that uh, when you look at the, the world news, does it anger you that leaders in countries in the Northern Hemisphere are not doing enough? Unfortunately, in Africa, we have um, a leadership, we have uh, leaders that, um, develop policies, but of course these policies are just on paper. There's no action. So a country like Zambia, we have got a lot of policies towards the environment, but uh, effecting, putting those policies into action, I think we fail, we fail to, we, we are more reactive. We tend to respond to a situation when it's too late. We have got good environmental policies, uh, mechanisms, and how we can respond. But then all these are just from, they're just, uh, they're, they're, they've been developed, but then they are not affected on the ground. So you find that, and also basically there's also lack of awareness. You can come up with a policy, but then if you haven't taken time to uh, raise awareness around that, the people, the, of course, the stakeholders within the community, different players, they won't be aware about this, that particular situation. So it's very frustrating to find that we've got a lot of policies and people when they're talking about these policies, you tend, you tend to think like we are going, to, like it's another, Zambia is another, Zambia or Angola, South Africa, just another beautiful country, but there's no actions. Then policies are not driven by actions. And that is very frustrating. Situation like uh, drought, storms, we tend to, we hear about uh, the weather situation from BBC. We hear about the, uh, the storm is coming from a different uh, um, news sources. 
from other experts, from American sources, but we have not taken them to invest in our own. But of course, we, we, we can't keep on crying that we are the victims, but we also try to respond. And uh, it's a leadership that we are lacking. And it's very frustrating. It's very frustrating. Yeah, it's very frustrating. Mike, I'm going to leave some of the questions, some very um, interesting questions in the chat. You might want to have a look at those yourself. Um, and I'm going to um, ask, I'm going to thank you very much for what you've said so far. I think that you've really inspired people um, with, with what you've, you've told us there. Um, we, we are missing Father Charlie Chalufya, who is another Zambian, but is um, based in Kenya. Um, and so I'm going to ask Zarina Ahmad um, to help us think about our own activism. And I know that some of the questions there um, uh, are kind of relating to that. Uh, Zarina, just to introduce her, is from Kilmarnock in Scotland. She's currently PhD researcher at the University of Manchester. And previously, uh, she was an environmentalist and climate change trainer and communicator with, um, I'm not sure how you say this, but it's CEMVO Scotland, um, which is a race equality organization working to build the capacity of the ethnic minority sector um, and a strategic partner of the Scottish government. Now she's specialized in the environmental field. And I think that before we ask the two of you questions, I'm gonna ask her, um, to listen to her expertise uh, as an environmental activist. So can I ask you, um, Zarina, to, to speak now, and then I'll be able to put the spotlight on you. I'm going to take the spotlight. There we go. Now I'm going to, I think there we are. Phew. <laughs> thank you, Marion, and thank you for inviting me on to um, participate in this really interesting discussion tonight. Um, so it's interesting because a lot of people label me as an activist, and it was something I really struggled with um, for a long time. I didn't see myself as an activist. Um, going back about 12, 14 years ago, I was working on a project which was a, a local community project in East Asia, a very rural area, a very deprived area, um, talking to communities about climate change and thinking about local community action. And I'd gone along to a meeting in Glasgow and we were there to talk about growing your own and gardening and setting up a gardening project. And, and somebody turned around and said, oh, there's a protest and a march at George Square we need to all go there because we're all activists. And as soon as they said the word activist, this whole panic came inside me because I'm like thinking, oh, that's not me. I'm not here to be an activist. I was just here to, to learn about gardening or you know, growing your own or setting up a community project. And I'm like, you know, really struggling in my head going, no, no, I'm not one of you. You know, I'm not an activist. I'm not here to do any disruption. And I think, it's really important to really think about, well, what does activism mean? And so over the years, I've really, really tried to have a deeper understanding of what forms of activism can be taken. Um, and this is really coming from somebody who's a person of color and living in a, in a place where when I grew up, there was a lot of racism. So I grew up with with being called all sorts of names, being beaten up at school and um, having to run for my life you know, many times when I was younger. And things have changed. Things have changed, and there's still a lot of change that can happen. But it became from this place of like not feeling allowed, able, um, in a place where I could have a voice and I could challenge things. So it came from a place of not being allowed to be an activist. And, and you know, in my own head, I wasn't allowed because I was always told to keep my head down don't say anything wrong, don't challenge authority, don't rock the boat. So it was a really, it came from this really like place where I wasn't supposed to have a voice. 
And all of a sudden now I'm like thinking, okay, I've got a voice, but not only do I have a voice for myself, I try to make sure that I open up the doors and create platforms for other people like myself to have voices. And these voices are really important um, because like, um, like Charles said, that a lot of the work that I've done is with people from different parts of the world, right? They've got connections to different parts of the world where climate change wasn't an abstract subject and still is for a lot of people in the UK. And, you know, we still think of climate change as something that's happening in the future. It's going to happen. The impacts are still to be seen. But for many of the people I worked with, their family, their relatives, their friends, their homeland were being impacted by climate change. And this is going back to 10, 12 years ago. So it's not just recent. And um, so I was listening to real, like I would say, like real life stories from people who were getting impacted by climate change. But at the same time, my work and the narrative that was coming out of Scottish government was still about behaviour change, local behaviour change, and about trying to protect something that's going to happen in the future for our children's generation. And I'm like, this isn't right, because this is about what's happening now to other people around the world. So for me, the first starting point is about being conscious and aware. So is, are we conscious and aware of our actions wherever we are and how it has an impact to other people around the world and how we're connected to other people and other communities around the world? Because what we do here is having an impact somewhere else. And we have to be conscious of that and we have to be aware of that. And we can't put on the blinkers and think, no, no, I'm quite happy in my little life like I did. For many years, like I said, I was not an activist. I, you know, I was like somebody, no, 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 don't call me an activist. And um, so yet yeah, quite happy in my own home. But what we do, what we're what our actions are doing is having an impact. So we have to be conscious. And then be conscious consumers. Think about well, what is it that we buy, use that is actually causing these climate impacts? So again, it's like thinking about all the little things that we can do and change at an individual level, at a community level, at a collective societal level, but also most importantly, is actually demand change. We have voices and we have voices that can demand change from governments, from local authorities, from corporations, Right. And we hear this, I mean, being an activist now, I hear this all the time, but you know, there's a market demand. There's a market demand for something, and that the market demands only corporations are only going to change, industry is only going to change if that market demand changes. But it's also being aware that, well, we're also fed messages that are telling us what our lifestyles should be like and what we need. And and even our education system gears us up to be successful by having a house, owning a house, owning a car, having materialistic things make us successful. But these are all ideas of capitalism. And capitalism, unfortunately, is one of the things that is contributing very badly to climate injustice. And um, so again, so thinking about climate change in terms of climate justice is a huge shift as well, because when we think about climate change, we just think about the weather and the impacts on the planet. But when we start thinking about climate justice, we're actually starting to think about our social injustices, social inequalities, and about how it impacts other people, how we're connected to other people as well. So I think we also have to have those conversations of climate justice alongside the conversations about climate change and about behaviour change. And with behaviour change, I'm always a little bit cynical and sceptical because there's only a limited amount of things that we as individuals can do if we don't have the right education, we don't have the alternatives to move into a different way of being. And um, if those choices aren't available, those better, greener choices aren't available for us, then what are we supposed to do? Um, and then when we're thinking about a just transition and moving into a better, greener way of being, it's also thinking about, well, who benefits from this just transition? Because we can't move into a just transition and then leave people behind. Because as we know, climate justice not only impacts people in other parts of the world, so those that are least contributing to climate change are the ones that are worst or getting the, being impacted the most by climate change. It actually happens in the UK too. 
I mean, we see that in London, um, there was the air pollution. There's a whole campaign and movement around air pollution because those are that are in the most deprived areas, the ones that have the least access to even like healthcare, are the ones that are being impacted by air pollution. Um, and these are structural inequalities that we have in our society. And again, thinking about food security, food security is another huge thing that I'm that I campaign a lot about because many people, um, as our price, as as the climate impact gets worse, our availability of food is going to get worse, but the prices go up. So again, those that are already struggling with the cost of living are going to be worst impacted by climate change. The ones that can afford it will always be able to afford it. And it doesn't matter what price things go up, they can always buy. Um, access to land. Again, we hear we heard a lot about COVID, in COVID about access to green space and how it's better, it's good for our good for the environment, but it's also good for our mental health and our well-being, and also for growing your own food. But who has access to land in the UK? You know, if we look around, and then again, it's like society is so split and so divided in terms of our social demographics and our um what do you call it, uh, the, uh, um, the amount of money we earn um, and just, just who does actually own land in Scotland or in the UK. Um, it's not easy to access land. And other people from other parts of the world that come to the UK, it's actually a different scenario in their own home countries because they've had land, even though it's a small bit of land, they have land where they can grow their own food. And when you come to the UK, it's a different story that having that access to land, it's not always there and you can't grow your own food. So again, we've, we create this really divisive society where access to food becomes a huge issue and then food becomes a human rights issue. And then thinking about heat, again, we heard from um, Mike about the, the devastation, um, devastating impacts of climate change and the hot weather in Africa. But even in the UK, the last few years, we've had really, really hot summers. And, and again, that impact of that heat, a lot of, a lot of the housing, a lot of offices and um, hospitals don't have air conditioning. Care homes don't have air conditioning. So those that are most vulnerable um, are being impacted the most because our infrastructures here aren't adapted and capable um, for climate change. And again, flood, we've got there's lots of research done in the UK. Those that are, live on flood risk areas, on the flood risk plains, are the ones that are in the poorest housing stock. And when we talk about poorest housing stock, we're not just talking about the like not owning your own home, but it's people don't have insurance. So if they lose everything in their in a flood, then they have no, they have it's much harder for them to build back their lives again. And then again, it's the access to resources. Who has access to resources to help them build back their lives again? Um, so for me, climate change is definitely a climate justice issue. Um, and we have to think about all the different intersectionalities um, like racial justice and um, gender justice and how other people are impacted by climate change, both in the UK and globally around the world. Um, so... And then I think we do have a voice. And unfortunately in the UK, we do have a voice. And many of us are in positions where we can hold our um, members of parliament, our local councillors to account. We can meet them and we can have conversations with them and we can challenge them and, see, and get them to address, to make targets um, more achievable. And to ask for that action, that like Mike was saying, that that action is not there. We have all these conversations, but where's the action? And we need action from top down. Um, so yeah, so that's all I have to say at the moment. Um, but I'm sure that I would love to hear what other people have to say as well. Thank you, Zarina. There are things going into the chat box like nobody's business. So I, th I think that what I'll do is to say, wow, you've given us a lot to think about too. 
and bring Mike back in if I can do that, if I can find him. Have I lost Mike? Have we lost Mike now? I think, I think. I think you have, Marion, I don't see I you. Think, I think he's dropped out, yeah. So, Zarina, you oh, are... You hit. <laughs> you're it at the moment. If he comes back, then, um, what, uh, what we can do, I, I have a lot of experience of Zambia, and I'm going there uh, in June uh, for the first time since before COVID, and I know how different things are. So there's possibly something in the chat box that um, I might be able to, to respond to as well. But I'm going to hand over to Grace Buckley, um, who's going yeah. to go through those questions and see where we can all get. And perhaps yeah. some of the rest of you can join in too. Thank you. Uh -huh. Okay, yeah, so that's what, sorry, can, can I just interrupt there? Sorry, Grace. Uh, I was just about to say that it would be really good, right, rather than just me speaking to everybody, it'd be really good as like if we could just have a, a conversation with everybody. So, you know, feel free to just yeah, jump in and, and chat away. I think I'm going to take the spotlight off you then. Yes. Let, <laughs> let everybody, oops, let. That's us. Is that going to work? Yeah. Yeah. So working. there we are. Um, and please just, Grace will go through what's uh, in the, the chat box, yeah. but please come in and um, make your comments uh, as, as well, please. Right. But the first question, and I'd ask, maybe it was Kwechi has put it in, about what methods do we think would be effective to educate people about climate change in Africa? Are you thinking, Kwechi, uh, people in Africa themselves or people elsewhere about climate change in Africa? Would you like to, to widen the question? You have to unmute yourself. Whoops. <clears throat> That's you. Oh, no, you're back. <laughs> Still on still mute. That's it. Oh. You're breaking up. Maybe if you put your, your video off, your, your your audio stream will be clear. That's okay. Would you like to ask your question, Kwechi, and explain, is it educating people in Africa or educating people elsewhere about climate change in Africa? Oh, come on. Can you hear? Yes, I can get you. What was the question you asked me earlier? But just your your question says, what methods do you do we think would be effective to educate people about climate change in Africa? Is it educating people in Africa about climate change or educating people in general about climate change in Africa? It's just so that people know what the question is more clearly. Mostly about climate change in Africa. Right. So yes. anyone got, want to take that one on? Marion, you got any thoughts on that? What would be effective to educate people yeah i i think that um people just really are are unaware of how drastic climate change is for people throughout africa from north to south um the often very different kinds of of um effects that, that are happening but uh, those of you who are Catholic and who supported Skiaf during Lent would know that the uh, their campaign uh, was uh, based on Zambia and uh, it was about people in the center of, of the country who really were finding it just absolutely horrific and trying to feed their families uh, and the the help that was given them by Skia meant that they were able to use um, seeds that were drought resistant and so on 
And I think that the idea that, um, you know, while it's hot in Africa anyway, kind of covers it. It doesn't. As, as we heard from Mike, the temperature is absolutely rocketing sky high and people just can't, you either get uh, that your seeds don't grow at all or you get the flood comes and washes those seeds away. And, and it's a kind of just, it, it's Sisyphus, you're, you're pushing that rock up the hill all the time. And I think that uh, we just don't realize that. I don't know, would you agree with me, Kwechi, on that? That Yes, I do. How difficult is it for people in Zambia right now to produce their own food? Okay, at the moment things are quite hard. Because I can give an example of uh, the previous conversation people had. Not everybody was able to plant something for their home or for food itself, which was quite hard because of the current parts that were not really good time, in the sense that people were made, unfortunately, due to climate change and how things are, uh, it is quite bad, it's quite bad to have so people. So climate change is really affected in so many ways. And I could do something of question that I asked Mr. Ray. Yeah, we're not getting you too well. Zarina, um, Grace, Zarina's had her hand up for ages. She may have a, a better comment than I've had. I don't know if it's a better comment, but I, uh, another another way is, um, is that I work with diff people from different parts of the world, communities that are connected to different parts of the world. And what I found, which was, re which was really impactful, is when you bring people together. So people sharing their own real life stories and telling people, bring, um, for instance, I was doing a workshop with um, a group that were from Gambia and they were meeting a group from Govan in Glasgow. And we were talking about recycled electronics and how that the UK send all these like, old computers and laptops away to Gambia. And when they're in Gambia, they're this mountain of these this waste this e-waste and and the the ladies from well, i think it was a group of ladies and they were talking about that they felt that they were doing something good because they were sending like old stuff that was no longer needed but didn't want it to go to waste so they thought they were doing good by sending it to like different parts of africa the ladies from gambia were then saying well you know, this is actually awful. This causing so much problems for us in Gambia. We're, we're, your, your waste is getting dumped on us. Those computers are no good to us either. You know, and then, and then also there's only small little particles, um, some, some kind of like mineral or ore that's inside the computers that is worth anything that is of value. And it's only little children that then go into these areas and then try to get it, but then they get polluted because there's like gases that are released and then also they hurt themselves and cut themselves and, and get infected so and it was only when they could hear that these real stories that it actually made an impact because and and the room was full of people that were just so compassionate towards each other then after that because before that before having those open discussions it was very much like well, you know from the leaders of government it's like well we're doing our bit Right. And then the ladies in government and the other ladies from Gambia were like, you know, like you still don't understand what's going on. You know, you're just dumping stuff on us. Stuff on us. So I think it's really important that we have, yeah, have those open spaces to have those open connections, open discussions. Um, yeah, I think that's and also I think the other point that I want to make is also where we get our news from, right, is really important. Because the way the news is broadcasted, sometimes the effects in another country is minimized. For instance, like the floods in Pakistan that happened just last year, in the summer of last year, that had an impact of, on 33 million people in Pakistan. That's one in seven people in Pakistan. And to put that into context, that's half the population of the UK have been impacted by those floods. But how much, how much was that on the news? And it was it was it was termed as a natural disaster 
And it was also termed as if the government hadn't done anything. If that had happened to any other country, you know, if it happened to the UK or the US, right, they wouldn't have been able to cope, right? Because it was such a big disaster. And it happened because of the climate, because of the, the ice caps on the Himalayas had melted and then the monsoon rains had happened. Um, so the, the rivers just the riverbanks just flooded over but it had a it is you know it impacted such a huge part of pakistan but again it was how is it reported in our news and um, and that happened to all different parts of the world and um, so it's also thinking about well where do we get our news who will be told from so if we can hear things and learn from people that are directly impacted i think it does help Anyone else want to come in with comments on that? No takers. Now I have to agree. I think the personal stories from, as Marion says, uh, organisations like SCIAF or CAFOD or any of the, the NGOs sharing what's actually happening on the ground and working with local partners, it affects people more, gets people to think about what's happening. Okay. Next question, which again was to Mike, uh, I'm not sure you're up for this one, Marion, is, is there any feeling or any sense of governments uh, in Africa speaking with one voice and responding to the impacts of climate change? You want to try that one, Mike? I think that's perhaps one that, that Kwechi might be able to, to come in on as well. Um, the... I think that the governments are making the same kind of mouth music that our own governments are making. And I think that that's part of the problem. Um, I mean, we're seeing that um, not just in some of the African countries. And of course, the African countries have, there are many of them that have other problems, other other things that they're looking at to, to, to try and deal with. Um, but I think that they are very aware of um, the fact that the Northern Hemisphere is not doing what it had said it would do. And I think that that is, is causing, um, I think that that is causing some uh, disquiet among leaders in, in Africa that, um, what was said at, at COP26 and COP27 um, and that gave them hope just wasn't followed through. And I think that that's where we have to go with that um, is, is to hold our politicians' feet to the fire, as it were, because I think that, um, you know, they, they're making promises and other governments are, are not able to act because their whole economic situation is failing because of climate, the climate crisis. You know, if, if you're not able, Zambia was supposed to um, export food uh, to Kenya this year and uh, it can't happen because uh, they, they haven't got food security themselves. So, you know, that, that makes it very difficult. And, you know, if your own um, economic situation is failing because of climate crisis, then it makes it very difficult. Kwechi, would you add to that? Uh, have you got anything to say about how your government is, is reacting? reacting? Yes, yeah, something to say, but uh, can you hear me? Can you turn your picture off again? If you turn the video off again, then we'll hear you better, I think. Okay, uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, so just to add on uh, the first question uh, that was uh, asked about what governments in Zambia or in Africa can do, I would just be specific to talk about Zambia, about how they can do in terms of uh, responding, how they're responding. Okay, so at the moment, the government is aware of what's happening, but due to how we are having less technology equipment to help people understand what to do. So the first steps that, are, that, are, that, are, that have been in, implemented is uh, trying to educate young ones about the importance of climate change and how they can understand it because 
majority of the people here in Zambia, to be specific, have no knowledge of what climate change is. They have no knowledge what it is because they just see it on TV people talking climate change, climate change, but they have no knowledge. So that trying to go to add uh, about climate change to be added in the school curriculum so learners may have knowledge about it, which is really happening right now. And as for me as a teacher, um, I've learned that I even talk, I even taught about climate change in some in the school that I was teaching previously before I, 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 am, I am now. So uh, learners have knowledge of what climate change is. So this is the first step that has been done. Uh, it may be slow, but it's quite effective because through learners, which are young, they can really have the knowledge of understanding what climate change is. And by doing that, they go home, share the knowledge with the people they live with. So I think this is the first step that the, the, the government is doing. But again, the other step is trying to come up with uh, small organizations that may be funded to help go around different types of uh, communities in Zambia that may, may, may need knowledge of what climate change is. So this is uh, the things that I can say that the Zambian government is doing at the moment to help people understand what climate change is because with what's happening, with the talk about climate change and so many devastating situations, I think, um, if learners are having knowledge, this may be very effective. So this is what I can add on with uh, the first question. That's, that's very interesting because Anne Dobbing, who has been a teacher too, so we've got two teachers here, Koechi and, and Anne. Um, uh, Anne has said that there was not anything um, when she was teaching about um, climate change on our curriculum. Is yeah. that has that changed now, Anne? As far as I know, it hasn't changed, although I've seen some very good units that have been um, you know, developed by local education authorities and and um and in schools particularly, you know, individual schools. But you know, for me it should be such an important thing that it should be part of the national curriculum, the, the curriculum for excellence in Scotland. Um, and I and I just thought that I did, I did write to John Swinney a few years ago, but it wasn't changed afterwards. You know, he just said thank you, but it didn't change. You know, it should be so important that it should be it should be a fundamental part of the curriculum. I mean, it it crosses over so many subjects. You're talking about science. You're talking about humanities. You're talking about you know literacy, numeracy, everything. It's it it's cross curricular. And it should be it should be included as a as a fundamental element in the whole curriculum. I think now. It sounds like we're behind what's happening in Zambia. If what Quechi has said about uh, teaching young people about the environment is yeah, yeah. You know, I mean. If you, you you write a curriculum, obviously the curriculum for excellence was developed over years. I think it was tested better than the national curriculum in England was, for example, um, which was just thrown at people. Um, but but um, it's not it's important that that a curriculum can evolve as time goes on. And when issues like climate change, you know, the, the fundamental threat to our planet you know, as, as has, has been um, identified. Um, I think that the curriculum should not be set in stone. It should actually be a, a, a changed to reflect that. You've raised another question, Anne, earlier on, and that saying is what, what would you say to people in Scotland who are carrying on their lives cheerfully using resources? And I wonder myself whether is it they're cheerfully using resources or they'd rather not think about the problem. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I've got lovely friends and family members in Scotland and, you know, all over the place, really, who don't want to know about climate change. <laughs> and I'm like a crack record. <laughs> <laughs> Pointing then, out. Yeah, and then I think, yeah, because I think climate change itself is like people find it really hard to grasp because it's an mm. abstract subject mm. right we talk mm. about carbon emissions right and we talk about tons of carbon emissions or your mm. carbon footprint right and for your everyday person that's really difficult to really get your head mm. around it but if we mm. talk about it in terms of like climate justice 
when we talk about like inequalities and justice because climate change is going to have an impact on everyone's land <laughs> in different ways mm. i think it's like connecting it making it relevant to each person mm. and how it affects mm. them and um, unfortunately we do live in a world where people are becoming more and more about me 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 individualists and again mm. that's you know one of the the side products of capitalism is this individualism mm. And we've lost that idea of collectivism. Mm-hmm. Um, but if we do think about it in those ways, then making it relevant to each person is, is really important rather than just seeing all oh, like, you know, the carbon footprint or, you know, you know, the emission. But if we think about like, well, how does it have an impact on your life or in your home or your mm-hmm. family? Mm-hmm. Then it changes, like- it changes the conversation then. I liked your idea, Serena, that you said about connecting people, you know, in different places, because I think when you can introduce people to each other and make a link between people, then you're not just talking about some unknown, you know, situation far, far away. You're actually talking about somebody who's who could be your friend who's being hurt, you know, by by what's happening. So I think that's really important, actually. Yeah, and I remember I went up to see a group in Aberdeen when the Aberdeen floods happened. And um, and we were talking about like climate justice and again, but we're talking about you know the global aspect of climate justice, we talk about floods in other parts of the world. And and I remember somebody in that group turned around and said, Well, well, my home got flooded, right? And I didn't have insurance and you know, and I've been I've not been able to go back to my home and all my family photographs were in that house. You know, everything that I owned was in that house and I've lost everything. And, you know, and you could see that they were a broken person. So, yeah. And and again, and that had like that had that stuck with me as well. And I think, you know, this isn't happening somewhere else. It's also happening here in Scotland. But yeah, you're right. It's bringing those stories to, to each to one of us, to each one of us so that we can create that empathy for us. Yes, sorry. Grace, you you raised the issue of climate change um, causing conflict. And Anne and Serena have just been talking about people being hurt by, uh, in, in, in in a different sense, by climate change. And I think there are two strands to that. I think um, you've you've got that individual hurt that comes from losing stuff from from your your home being devastated uh, from perhaps losing family members uh, in some kind of climate situation Mike described that in 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 Mozambique with the cyclones which just uh, horrific Um, and I've witnessed flooding in Mozambique um, where just everybody was was so badly affected. But the conflict, I think, comes from the fact that uh, if, if you've lost everything and you can't grow your crops or you can't, um, you can't have your livelihood anymore, you've got to go somewhere. And that causes conflict, whether it's small scale conflict in that the people in the next town or the next country don't really want you there because they're having problems or it's it creates a a, a bigger conflict between countries um i think that it does really have an impact i don't know what serena might think about that um no i i'm totally on on board with with the idea that well not it's not even an idea it's not an ideology it's it's reality that climate change is having an impact on conflicts and it's going to have a a, a more detrimental impact because if you think about like even like the um like fossil fuels oil oil is one of the biggest things that causes an uh, causes conflict around the world right and it's something that we we tiptoe around but we can't tiptoe around if we're talking about fossil fuels. It's like, well, who owns oil? Who fights over oil, right? I um, mean, even now, like the Ukraine and Russia war is it's basically about oil. It's about that pipe, that gas pipe pipeline, and that access to oil. And and you know, again, it's always like US want to have access, Russia want to have access. Again, Syrian war, the Syrian war was around oil conflict. You know, it's around oil and access to oil, but it's not just oil; it's also water resources as well. 
So in parts of the world, like you said, that some places have droughts. And, and, and I've seen this in lots of different countries where people are fighting for access to water, like governments are fighting for access to water and the rights of who owns that water because water shortage is getting worse and worse. So it's like, and then now we've got food security is going to be a huge issue. So it's about, it's about ownership as well. I think with that conflict comes ownership. Who has the rights to it? Who wants the rights to it? Who has the power to have the rights to it? Who holds the power? And it's something that as an individual, that can seem a bit scary to deal with. It's like, well, I have no control over that. But then again, as a collective, Group, we can have an imp we can have we can have power to make those changes or ask for those changes or demand those changes. But it is worrying about yeah the conflict and, and climate change. Yeah, hey, and Maureen, I, I think you were going to come in there. Sorry. Maureen. Oh, you're on I'm not mute. hearing you. You're not muted, but have you got your microphone on? Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Hi, okay. On the point of water, just this week, um, in, South, in South Africa, there is a major problem in Cape Town because all the rich have swimming pools and the poor cannot access water. So, the water issue is going to be very much in our faces because exactly the same thing's happening in London because Rishi Shunak has got a new pool mm -hmm. and he has managed to get the electric grid sort of sorted to suit him. But it's not just about the electricity, it's about the, it's about the water. It's about the fact that all these people have water for leisure purposes and people can't access water to drink. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the Rushi Sunak one really brings it home, doesn't it? It's, I mean, and he's not the only one, but yeah, a lot of like the rich people can, can have, they can have as much as they want to, they can have the... The, the five cars on the driveway and they can wash their cars down even in a horse pan by pipe ban and yet there's people in the UK that are struggling to like even get good quality drinking water in London you know yeah it, and, and it is and it's, it's getting worse it is getting worse so it's, it, the question is to all of us is like well what what can we do to to, to start demanding this change that is needed uh, on another note, I mean, so I am hoping to go to France this summer and I'm going by train. And most of my friends and family just can't get their heads around that. Because it would be so much cheaper for me to just get on a plane. And, and you know, the they're trying not to engage with me, to be honest. <laughs> they're just kind of mentally patting me on the head and <laughs> stop. <laughs> yeah, okay, mum, fine, okay. And, and I'm finding the whole reaction quite amazing because I would have thought that it was more reasonable to even consider it, but mm. absolutely not. So yeah, weird. It's funny you saying that because I've just come back from America and um, and I was there for like this climate change leadership thing and and one of the things that really struck me was the amount of vehicles on the road. I I mean I thought the UK was bad, right? And at least we're moving forward slightly in terms of like different having trying to have different policies in place and and you know different groups, but there it's just so normal for people to get into their big cars they don't even have small cars they have big SUVs and these big trucks and pickup trucks and people just drive from state to state because that's the only way that they can or they have to fly right so like interstate like, you know interstate is either flying or driving 
there are no trains, there's no trains, there's no reasonable coaches. And, and it's just so normal. That is the norm for them to do that. And it just, and the amount of, of vehicles, the people, the size of the states, and you just think, how are we going to change? You know, when this is such an enormous thing, beast that needs to be changed. You know, sitting in the UK, it seems much easier to do. But when you go to somewhere like the US, it's just, it, it's an even bigger beast. And yet, and there's not a, there's not a, a hunger for change either. Because people don't want to give up. They don't want to live in a different way. And it is challenging. And the money behind all of that, that, that comes from the oil and so yeah, on. Yeah, the lobbying and yes, the campaigning. Yeah. It, it makes it very difficult but we all we all have voices uh, and I think that we can we can all use those voices stick to your guns Maureen <laughs> keep on those trains <laughs> I would love to be that courageous and go on a train I, I was in Paris and the thought of going by train sort of came to my head and I thought no the chances are the train would go and strike or it would not run and I would miss the meeting but hey I, I, I will try again Question that you have raised, and I know he's gone and left us, but it's one that we haven't really touched on yet. Uh, if I can find a blasted thing, was it gone? Rab's got, Rab's got a comment. Rab, are you coming in? Sorry. Can you come? It's just relating to what you're saying about in the States. Years ago, when I, I did a, a master's in theology at New College, and there was one of the uh, directors, he was with Channel 5 at the time, but he'd worked in the States. First, he said in Channel 5, the, I think it was the time of the Los Angeles earthquake or whatever, and there was devastation there. And also, whether it was in Bangladesh, somewhere in Asia, there was terrible floods. And he said he knew, as a, as a Christian, Los Angeles, America can rebuild itself, no bother. People needed to hear about, you know, how they could support people in Bangladesh or wherever it was. He said, but... The news people said, no, we've got cameras in Los Angeles. That's the story we'll go with. And he said he also worked, and I never appreciated this, and what one of the big programs that people in the States watch from all different walks of life is about the, the economy and their stocks and shares and various things. And part of the program was news reports, and they, they did one. It was related even back then to climate change. And it had to get pulled because the people that sponsored the shows say nobody's going to watch that and then buy this 50, 60,000 pound car. You know, if you're asking them to give money and, and bring it out what's really happening in the world, we just we must have good news stories, bury everything else. And it was that how do people find out? And I know one of the things my daughter goes on about all the time is saying that the, the weather people continually refer to still, oh, it's a wee bit freak, it's a wee bit new, isn't it good we're having a heat wave? You know, it's, anyway, that's my wee rant. <laughs> no, but it's, it's so, it's so true, because that, and that's what all of us, the masses are getting fed. Like, you know, these like, narratives that this is so no, like, the, that it's not, it's not a climate disaster. This is just either like a freaky disaster or it's just a natural disaster. Um, and one of the reasons, one of the other reasons, like you said, is like, like you said, it was like, it's, it's people with the money, the industry behind things as well that want to sell, sell, sell. Um, but it's also governments are reluctant to announce things as climate disasters. So like, like even like looking back at the Pakistani floods that happened just recently, um, it took, I think, about two months before it was declared as a climate disaster. And the reason for that was because as soon as it's declared as a climate disaster, the UN can hold the rest of the world, the, the rest of the nations responsible. And the, the other countries don't want to be held responsible for any climate disasters. And they have to then give the resources to help um, and that's and that that is again a real challenge and, and also refugees it's really hard to label refugees as climate refugees if people are displaced because or because of a climate issue because again it's like who takes responsibility for that then it doesn't help that um 
uh, Suella is trying to send some of our existing refugees to Rwanda at the same time as we've got other problems. I found Hugh's question that's something we haven't touched on yet, perhaps given the, the way the time is marching on. He was asking, in what more can the church, and let's widen that out to faith communities, what more can church and other faith communities do to actively create change, both in local contexts within Africa and in sharing that, that African and other experiences of climate catastrophe with the wilder world? What was the role? What can the churches and the faith communities do? Can I throw that to people? Anyone want to take that one on? Father Jim, have you got anything to say on that? Yeah, I think I think one of the things that Zarina spoke about was this awareness, you know, and I think part of the problem is, you know, people in churches are aware of other things uh, and they're aware of uh, various different injustices as such. For some reason, climate change is still, or care for the earth is still really something that's quite almost... Um, not just new, if you like, but um, unfamiliar, let's say. And I think we have to make it more and more familiar. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I've even heard things like, you know, the, 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 I know Bishop John Arnold down in, down in Salford is a big advocate for the environment and so on. And even some, some of the clergy there or other people kind of mocking him, making fun of him because of his stand on the environment. We have to stop ridiculing people who are... Um, who are, you know, putting this on the agenda. And the church has to put it on the agenda. Obviously, Pope Francis is a big advocate of this. But in the local pews, you know, and in the local churches and in the, uh, you know, in the activities that we do, we have to make priorities or make or prioritise, if you like, the whole climate change thing. Because I think Zarina was right. She's talking about not just climate justice, you know, it's, it is a justice issue. And the church, you know, is an advocate for justice. Uh, so we have to make it more and more vogue, if you like, but at a local grassroots level as well, I think. Not to be afraid of, you know, of, of, of yeah, ramming it down people's throats because that's what has to happen. Yeah, Marianne, when you go. I think that it's interesting that while the rest of the world of all faiths and none uh, think that uh, Pope Francis's Laudato Si encyclical is the best thing since sliced bread and something that should be followed, the Catholic Church, um, it, it kind of go, people say Laudato what? Um, and haven't really taken it on board. And I think we're beginning to, but that that encyclical really just has to be um, grasped and and uh, embraced as other faiths are embracing it and and other other nations of, of, around the world are, are embracing it. Um, and here in the UK, we're just not. So I think that that's something that we can do. Rina. Yeah, I was going to say, Rina, yep. Yeah, I, yeah, I agree. I think, and I'm, I've been working with faith leaders from different faiths for the last 10 years. And when I speak to them on an individual level, they get it. They understand it. They're passionate about the change. They're, they're passionate about the injustices and wanting to, to change the world. However, when it comes to their congregation, it doesn't seem to translate. So that personal conviction that they have then I don't know what happens at that uh, when they become their professional selves it just doesn't seem to translate and I don't know if they're scared of the reaction that they're going to have from the congregation or they have other agendas that take priority um, but I find I found that it becomes talking about climate justice becomes a backseat and it's only the very few that will take it forward. And I don't know if this needs to be much more structured from a higher, higher 
hours within different faith groups. And I know a lot of faith groups don't, aren't always structured the same as Christianity, that they don't have heads of states or heads of religions. And um, so that might also be another issue for different faith groups. But I think we need to provide our faith leaders with some kind of I was going to say tools to give them confidence, but it's not tools, but it's just even just to give them the reassurance that they can take this space up to see things that are a bit more challenging. I think the problem I have to say in the Catholic Church in America is that you've got a real divide between those who believe in climate change and those who don't. Uh, EWTN is... Uh, much favoured by some of my congregation, and they're all anti. There's no such thing as climate change. We know better. So it's, I think there, there, there is an issue. I don't know whether it's uh, common to other faith communities. You have a split like that, but it's almost a political split. And I think we have to recognise that there's a lot of the politics in it as well as the faith issue. Somebody was asking, maybe you've said, Rab, could tell us a bit more about Laudato C. I don't know if we've got time at the moment. What do you think, Marianne? We've got a couple of minutes, and yep. then, yeah, great. Yeah, I think it was Anne mentioned and Maureen started out the Laudato Sea Animators Training, which is a, a brilliant course for educating people about Laudato Sea and how they can implement it in their parish. And, and there are, this is a group of Scottish animators, Maureen's one of them, that meet together and try and do things within our parish. On Saturday, I'm going to the Eco Congregation Scotland meeting, which again is many parishes that are trying to do things in their own way. We, we, the Bishops' Conference in Scotland uh, send out uh, materials for the season of creation to every diocese in Scotland, but I don't know how they get through to the, the parish priests or whether, I think, within our archdiocese, they send it out on the Friday night before the Sunday, which is uh, very helpful at all. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so I think there is material there, and I, think, I know within our parish we used to, before we got sidetracked uh, every week there was a, a, a bidding prayer for creation and it was just working at that slowly and and trying to emphasize it so the Laudato Si movement I think is well worth looking up doing tremendous stuff and also I think within our primary schools I think the Scottish Catholic Education Service is aiming for all primary school, schools should be Laudato Si schools within the next couple of years and they're the young people are doing tremendous work. I mean, I, I found one of the most inspiring things I find is when I go along to the, the, the Fridays for the Future at the Scottish Parliament and, and the way the young people, one, have a microphone system that you can actually hear the speakers, which is I always find great, uh, and just share. You know, there's no bitterness, just people sharing ideas and then becoming activists as such, which is so important. Finally, I mean, I mean, one of the nicest ones was when my, my grandchildren were working out when I was taking them to school, the days I could get arrested on, uh, that didn't interfere with me taking them to school, which I thought was very kind of them. <laughs> but yeah, so I definitely encourage people to promote and look at the Laudato Si movement material. I'm going to have to keep that story as a beauty. We'll keep that for somewhere. <laughs> right. right, we're 26 minutes past eight. Uh, any, I'm just looking at me, I think we've dealt with most of the questions uh, and most of the points, and some of the points have been very good. Um, anything anyone wants to bring up that I haven't touched, we haven't discussed before we pass over to Father Jim? I've, yes, I've got one more last thing to say, and it's, it's about our relationship with the land and um, with planet Earth. Um, I mean, I've thought a lot about climate justice and about people and centering people's experiences through climate change, but again, um, from a lot of faith contexts, climate change, climate justice or climate change is really much about the planet Earth, about Mother Earth. But yet, how much are we connected to that land? How much do we, you know, when we go to a, to a congregation, to um, to church, to you know, a mosque or a temple, it's always internally. It's in a building, you know. It's not outside it's not in nature it's like can we do more to have faith connected to the outdoors to actual to nature and the, and the natural environment rather than just to buildings 
But I just, you know, I, I think during the time of COVID, people yeah. experienced a real religious connection as they got outside. And I think for many of them, that's why they thought, I'm not going back to my church. I'm encountering God here in new ways in the creation. I, I have the same, yeah, I, I struggle when I go into like a temple or a church or anything. I don't feel that spiritual connection. I know many people do, but as soon as I'm in a forest or on the mountains, I get it. We've tried to bring some of the outset, not quite into the, the, the church buildings, but we have, as Marion knows, we have now got our little COP26 um, orchard begun. We've got four apple trees and a pear tree. And they're still alive. They've survived the winter, so we're going there. So it's, it's one way of starting. It, you're, but you're absolutely right, getting people used to... If you're living in a town, getting out to nature, I'm lucky where I live. Marion's lucky where she lives. I mean, I'm beside two of the park, so I can just go out the door and be in the park. But for so many people living in the centre of towns, it must be really, really hard. Right. Yeah. Thank, thank, it, you, thank you for that, Grace. And, and thank you, Zarina. Um, thank you all. I'm not going to apologise for the fact that things didn't turn out the way that they were intended to turn out tonight, because I think that it's actually brought us together and made us have um, a, a good discussion, which I hope that you'll take on into your own communities and that we'll work together, because I think that working together, all the different organisations that we belong to, let's just make those um, connections. And uh, so thank you for being all being guest speakers tonight. And I'm going to now hand over to Father Jim and we'll bring the evening to a close with a prayer. Thank you so much. I'd just like to finish with a prayer by Pope Francis again from Laudato Si. And it's a Christian prayer in union with creation. Father, we praise you with all your creatures. They came forth from your all powerful hand. They are yours, filled with your presence and your tender love. Praise be to you. Son of God Jesus, through you all things were made. You were formed in the womb of Mary, our mother. You became part of this earth and you gazed upon this world with human eyes. Today you're alive in every creature in your risen glory. Praise be to you. Holy Spirit, by your light, you guide this world towards the Father's love and the company creation as it groans and travail. You also dwell in our hearts and you inspire us to do what is good. Praise be to you. Free you in God, wondrous community of infinite love, teach us to contemplate you in the beauty of the universe, for all things speak of you. Awaken our praise and thankfulness for every being that you have made. Give us the grace to feel profoundly joined to everything that is. God of love, show us our place in this world as channels of your love for all the creatures of this earth, for not one of them is forgotten in your sight. Enlighten those who possess power and money, that they may avoid the sin of indifference, that they may love the common good, advance the weak, and care for this world in which we live. The poor and the earth are crying out. O Lord, seize us with your power and light. Help us to protect all life, to prepare for a better future, for the coming of your kingdom, justice, peace, love and beauty. Praise be to you. Amen. Amen. Amen and thank you so much. As I said, thank you all. Um, Mike has a message to apologise that he just fell out of the system, uh, but he said that he'd been listening to Serena and um, he was very grateful for having been able to do that. So we'll see you all soon. I think the Holy Spirit works in uh, mysterious ways. Thank you. <laughs>